to Malachi chapter 3, verses 6 through 12. Malachi 3, 6 through 12. As you're doing that, hey, turn to the person next to you and say, Jesus looks good on you. Shelly, Jesus looks good on you. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> I love how everybody turns to everybody and they're like, Jesus looks good on you. I mean, if, if I saw Jesus on you, I'd be like, Shelly, Jesus looks good on you. Jesus looks good on you. <laughs> Same with joy. Jesus looks good on you. Man, what are you wearing today? Is it Jesus? I love that. Jesus Chanel number 25. I love it. Love it, love it. Malachi chapter 3. We're continuing on our service. Um, and working the ground, working the ground. So uh, if you got it, say amen. amen. If you need a minute, say give me a minute. Also, we'll stand as we read God's word today, starting in verse 6. I know that we find ourselves in the middle of a conversation, but I'll get you caught up in it. So it says this, Because I, the Lord, have not changed, you descendants of Jacob have, have not been destroyed. Since the days of your fathers, you have turned from my statutes. You have not kept them. Return to me, and I'll return to you, says the Lord of armies. Yet you ask, how can we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. How do we rob you, you ask? By not making the payments of the tenth and the contributions. You are suffering under a curse, yet you, the whole nation, are still robbing me. Bring the full tenth into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Test me in this way, says the Lord of armies. See if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing for you uh, for you without measure. I'm going to stop right there. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now. And Father, we just thank you, Father, for who you are. We thank you for how you speak into our lives. We thank you, God, for how... You are the God who does not change. We thank you, Father, that you are steady and, uh, and unshakable. We thank you, Father, for what you are about to do in this place right now with us. Come, have your way. Holy Spirit, just engulf us right now. We love you. We praise you. We thank you. We ask, God, that you would open up our eyes and our ears and our hearts. Father, we want to be able to see and hear and feel your word today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, when you sit down, turn to the person next to you and say, Jesus looks good on you. you Jesus. Jesus. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, guys are, you guys are feeling it right now. You guys are totally feeling it. Woo. So good. So good. <clears throat> my, sermon, my sermon title today is called, Everything Belongs to God. Say, Everything Belongs to God. So Malachi, the prophet Malachi, he is speaking to the Jewish people, and he's reminding them of what they're doing. Here's what's going on. Things are falling apart in Jerusalem. God's chosen people are willingly, willfully being disobedient right now. And it's starting with the priests. The priests are uh, starting with them, and it's they're being disobedient, and so it's like, the priests, the leaders, the, the pastors are starting to disobey, and it's leaking down into the, the congregation. It's leaking down into the nation. And here's what's happening. They had shown contempt for, for God's name. They're, they're offering false worship. They're leading others into sin, and they're, they're breaking God's laws. They're, they call evil good. Come on. It sounds like something that is happening right now. They kept God's tithes and offerings for themselves and they became, they became arrogant. And the relationship was broken with God and, and the judgment and the punishment would soon be theirs. It's going to be theirs. And we show up in chapter 3 of Malachi and we find ourselves in, this, in the middle of this conversation that the Lord is having with these folks. There are three points in the scripture that we read today that I want us to pay attention to. Get ready to write it down because we're going to jump in it right away. Point number one, in the middle of this conversation, God says, uh, 
that he does not change. Point number one is God does not change. Say God does not change. <laughs> Let me pull it up on Malachi 36. It says that because I, the Lord, right, we're in the middle of a conversation. I'm bringing you in the middle of the conversation. He says, because I, the Lord, have not changed, you descendants of Jacob have not been destroyed. They thought that, that God was being unfair to them. And here's the thing. He's reminding them of one of the greatest truths. Hey, I, the Lord, do not change. He's saying that I'm the one who's being constant here. You know, in, in theology, the unchangeableness of God's essential nature and character is called the immutability of God. Immutability of God. This is what that word means. It means this, unchangeable. Say unchangeable. unchangeable. Means unshakable. Say unshakable. unshakable. Means constant. Say constant. 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 Means lasting. Say lasting. lasting. Means persistent. Say persistent. persistent. His character is called in, immutability of God, which means unchangeable, unshakable, constant, lasting, and persistent. Listen, people change, but God is constant and faithful. You know, the world plays by a different playbook than with what God does. They have a different playbook than what the Lord has. And sometimes, you and I, us, we find ourselves following the playbook of the world, and then we get consumed in it. We stop doing certain things of the, Lord, uh, the Lord's way because we have become lazy or we have lost our discipline. We just want to do our own thing. We find that happening now. What I've, what I've been finding is, is that since COVID has happened, what I've noticed that when church doors opened again, people stopped coming, and that shocked me. Because, you see, the world had a different playbook. The world had a different playbook. It said, this is how we're supposed to play God has a different playbook because he says, I, the Lord, do not change. Just because there's a pandemic doesn't mean you should stop gathering together to, to worship me. And we find folks who've just given up by just going to church. I'm not saying they've given up on God. I'm just saying they've given up on gathering. The Bible says that we should. But in this case, in Malachi's case, God is speaking to them about their giving of their tithes and their offerings. Here's a reminder back in Leviticus that he, he brings to, to the table. He says this, this comes from the New Living Translation. It says, one tenth of the produce of the land, whether grain from the fields or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It must, it must be set apart to him as holy. Look back at it, it says that, um, uh, I'm going to start over. One tenth of the produce of the land, whether grain from the fields uh, or the fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It must be set apart uh, to him as holy. If you want to buy back the Lord's tenth of the grain or fruit, you must pay its value plus 20%. Count off every tenth animal from the herds and flocks and set them apart for the Lord as holy. Listen, God expected his people to return to him a portion of what already what he already owned and he graciously lent them. He also said, listen, you can redeem your tithes and your offerings, but at a 20% markup. <laughs> God is a business guy, right? And so <clears throat> that's what he said. And so basically what he is, uh, and one of the main reasons for requiring the tithes was very practical. It was, uh, it was uh, this is how the priest, this is how the, the tabernacle, this is how Israel's entire sacrificial system was funded. The tithes and offerings were brought in to the storehouse. And this is what took care of the priests. This is what took care of the, the tabernacle, the building. This is what took care of uh, the nation. That's what tithes and offerings do. Your, your tithes and offerings take care of the staff here at Living Water. It helps, helps keep, <laughs> helps pay the rent, uh, which I will one day say we don't have rent because we'll have a place. 
but it helps pay the rent. But it also helps us be able to impact our community more. Impact our community more. And that's what, the, what God is saying here. That is what he said it is requiring the tithe. It was very practical. And so this was not happening. In Malachi said this, this wasn't happening. So the Lord reminds them, hey, I have not changed my idea. I have not changed my thoughts. I have not changed my plans on when it comes to, to your tithes and your offerings. That hasn't changed at all. And that's what we're really getting down to here. We're getting down to the nitty gritty. He's like, I haven't changed my mind on that. What makes you think I've changed my mind on that? That's why he said in verse 6, because I, the Lord, I have not changed. I have not changed. Can I tell you something? I love the fact that our Lord does not make compromises. Come on, somebody. Our Lord does not make compromises. He says, this is how you're going to do it. Uh, or don't do it, and we're to follow it. Lord, please, can I just keep sitting for just a little bit longer? Is it okay if I continue to do this? Don't we negotiate with God? We do sometimes, right? When we, we want our own desires and our own wills, and we know that it's not what we're supposed to do. Don't we negotiate with God? Lord, please, if you just let me do this one more time, I promise you I will follow your ways and, and walk in your ways. Oh, I wonder how many times God has heard that. I wonder how many times we've said that. <laughs> Compromise. The Lord has reminded me all the time. He's like, Jason, do you remember what I told you? Yeah. Well, what makes you think I'm going to change my mind on that? The Lord, I'm afraid. I know that you're afraid, but I'm there. Come on. Compromises. The Lord, is it okay if I just stay here for a little bit longer and play by the world's playbook? Is that okay? It's not. Because the Lord says, I do not change. Say, everything belongs to God. Let's look at verse 7 and 9. Right? This point right here, this is my point. It says, stop robbing from God. Say, stop robbing from God. Since the days of your father, now the conversation is still going, you have not kept them. He says this, he says, return to me and I will return to you. I read that in James. The Bible says, in, or James says, that if you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Here he is reminding the people of Israel, he's reminding these, these priests and these other people, he says, if you return to me, I will return to you. How many of you want to see the return of Jesus? Oh, yeah, I knew I'd get some amens out of that one, right? So if we draw near to God, Lord, I just want to continue to keep sinning. I just want to continue to keep dancing in this part right here. He says, no, come to me, and, and, and I'll return to you. I love how it says, says the Lord of armies. Yet you ask, how can we return? Will a man rob God, he says? Yet you are robbing me. How do we rob you, you ask? By not making the payments of the tenth and the contributions, you are suffering under a curse, yet the whole nation, yet you, the whole nation, are still robbing me. Don't withhold from God what already belongs to God. What does that mean? Well, listen, your life belongs to God, doesn't it? Your family belongs to God. Your possessions, your house, your car, your food, your couches, you name it, they belong to God. Your job, it belongs to God. Your finances, it belongs to God. It's all His. <clears throat> Everything belongs to God. You see, it's His gift to you. So we are, we are doing, so what we are doing is giving a portion of what is already His back to Him. It's already yours. And I'm going to give it back to you. When we approach giving with the mindset that everything belongs to God, we realize what a blessing it is that he allows us to give these resources back to him to be used for his glorious purposes. Listen, listen to this. Proverbs eleven twenty four says this. There is one who scatters and yet increases all the more. And there is one who withholds what is justly due, and yet it results only in want. 
What this proverb is saying is, is that we can't give God the leftovers. We can't give to him out of the leftovers. And maybe even out of the leftovers, we're giving him a lot of the leftovers, right? With a lot of the leftovers. But it's unacceptable because it came from what we had left after we spent the best parts on ourselves. The Lord says, bring the first fruit. Bring all of it to me. Lord, I've got, I've got like a, I've got 50 cents and a cock drum. That's all I got left. But man, I've got this surround sound stereo system that is in my house right now. It is so good. So good. I'm going to watch with the boobah. I'm going to be able to see the Super Bowl on my big screen TV. Lord, I bought it for the Super Bowl. And I got this announcement. I'm going to not only hear the snot come out of the guy's nose, but I'll probably feel it. <laughs> so good. So good. I'm going to be able to hear the ref speak, Lord. It's going to be so good. But all I got left is 50 cents in the cop car. That's all I got left. That's all I got left. Here's what I got left, because I spent the best on me. I spent the best on my family. I spent the best on my house. Listen to what Malachi 1.8 says. Listen to what God says about this. He says, when you offer blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? Leftovers. What I got left? When you sacrifice lame and diseased animals, is that not wrong? He says this, try offering them to your governor. Mm. When I read that, what a punch in my face. He says, would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you? Says the Lord Almighty. Statistics typically report that the average local church is supported by 20% of its members. And that the average Christians give less than 3% of his or her income to God. So many Christians, in my, uh, in my thoughts, are many Christians that suffer from this uh, uh, cirrhosis of the giver. Cirrhosis of the giver. What I mean by that is that when it comes time to, to take the offering, when it comes time to, to give a, a, a tip, reaching into our wallet or, or grabbing our purses to support the ministry uh, it is almost like the general paralysis has, has really crept in. It's like, it's so hard. I can't, I can't do it. But we are instantly healed when we walk into the mall or go to the restaurants or, or go to the movies. We have no issues doing it then. You see, we cannot accomplish kingdom work when we steal from the kingdom. 1 Corinthians 16, 2 says this, right? The point is stop robbing from God. It says this, it comes from the voice. It says on Sunday, the first day of the week, I want each of you to sit aside an amount as God has blessed you. So the funds will be collected by the time I come. If you have the NIV or if you have the King James, it says, uh, the, Paul says to the church to set aside the gift of the first day of the week. Well, the first day of the week is what? So let me go to the calendar. Let me take that out. Sunday, right? So Sunday. So what is so special about Sunday? Why must we set it aside on the first day of the week? Why on Sunday? What's so special about it? It's the church's day of worship. Paul said that when you go to church to worship God, make sure giving is part of your worship. He says, giving is not something that you just throw into a worship service. It's an act of worship to God. It's an act of worship to God. It should be holy. It should be, it should be uh, an act of worship. I have, I have grown up in the church. I know nothing but church. This is all I know. Uh, and I, I praise God that I had a family who raised me up in a church. But I remember as a kid, I remember as a teenager, sometimes when, when we would start collecting the tithes and the offering, I would hear the pastor at, the, at some of the times, he would say, let's hurry up and gather the tithes and offerings so we can get this out of the way. 
Now, as a kid, as a teenager, it's like, all right, must be a party happening afterwards. I don't know, right? But they would say that. It was like it was not important to them. It wasn't important to them. Or I would watch churches, and they would, they would gather the, the tithes and offering, and the ushers look like stormtroopers. You know what I mean? Like rigid, stiff. Dun, 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 you know? And they would just gather, they'd pass the offering plate. And if you didn't take it, they'd, excuse me, please take the offering plate. And they would stare. If you didn't put anything in the plate, they would stare at you. Sinner. <laughs> Then they got it. And I'm serious, right? And then they would collect. They would collect the um, the offering, and then they would all walk down to the center of the aisle, like stormtroopers, and they would stand there like soldiers. And we would sing a song. We would sing this song, and it became ritual. We just sang this song, and everybody's like, "This is what we do." And after it's all said and done, somebody would pray for it, and then they would walk away and and, and, and go to the Death Star or wherever that is that they go. <laughs> You see, I don't understand how a church wants to hurry it up and make it feel like it's a ritual or make it feel like it's a religious thing. Because I got to be honest with you, when we collect our tithes and our offering, it's personal. It's relational. It's worship. It's giving our very best to the Lord. It's coming to the altar saying, Lord, here's my first fruit. I want you to have this. This is what I want you to have. It's an act of worship. It's, a, it's, a, it's an act of love to the Lord. Jesus gives us an example in Luke 11. Listen to what he says here. He says, But woe to you Pharisees. You give a tenth of mint, rue, and every kind of herb, and you bypass justice and love for God. These things you have done without neglecting the others. Listen, tithing without love, and tithing, uh, tithing without love for for or obedience to God amounts to nothing more than a meaningless ritual. Meaningless ritual. Here's my 50 cents in a cough drop. I know a pastor. I know a pastor who told his congregation that if you did not tithe at least $500 a month, you would not be blessed. He stood on stage and he said this out loud during a sermon. He says, if you are a person who does not tithe $500 or more a month, you are not going to be the blessed ones. Those who do give $500 or more, those are the blessed ones. Can I tell you something? That's not true. Can I tell you something? That's his ego. That's what that was. And whoo, did he and I have a very long conversation after that sermon? Then you don't think that a youth pastor has something to say about that. This youth pastor did. It's an act of worship to God. Don't you agree? Yes. When he comes to your tithes and your offering, it's an act of worship to God. This means that God evaluates our giving the same way he evaluates our singing. And some of you are like, oh, no. I can't even see a lick. Hallelujah. Please don't, don't judge that one. But he, but he does. He, he evaluates. He evaluates our praying. He evaluates my preaching, your preaching, or any other element of worship. Listen, giving to God first is crucial because it shows how much you value him. It expresses your faith in his ability and willingness to provide for you. Last, last point. <laughs> I know that for some of us this is hard to hear, but can I tell you something? I will never apologize for what the Word says. Amen. I will never apologize. I'm not meaning to step on your toes, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna apologize for this. <clears throat> I know that it's hard, but come on, just let's go through it together, okay? Right? Uh, last, last verse, first sentence says this. This is, this is the uh, third point. Third point is experience his promises. Experience his promise. Verse 10. Bring the full tenth to the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. 
Remember in Leviticus, we talked about how it was to take care of the priest and the tabernacle and everything else. So bring the full tents to the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Listen to his next word. He said, test me. In this way, says the Lord of the armies. He says, see if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing for you without measure. I want to read that to you again. He said, test me. See if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing for you without measure. Listen, God's not testing you. He's telling you to test him. He's telling you, the one who does not change, he says, try me. He says, watch me. See what I do. I dare you to do it. Because when you do it, the blessings will be without measure. Without measure. Man, I used to be, listen, I used to be a sweet tea drunkie. Oh my gosh. I would drink sweet tea like it was water. It was so good. So good right now. Just have a flashback. But imagine the blessings without measure. If someone was to pour me a glass of sweet tea and I would never run out, that's amazing. That's amazing. Think about the blessings of God that it would be constantly being poured out on you and you would never run out. You would not have a place. It says you would not have a place big enough to receive it. But here's what I don't want you to get mixed up in, in this thought. God does not promise you to, to give you earthly wealth when you give generously to the kingdom. You see, God's not a slot machine. He's not a slot machine. But what is a blessing for a blessing of God is experiencing and, and enjoying and extending the goodness of God in your life. Listen, you can have money and not be blessed. You can have you can be wealthy and have no joy or peace. It's, it's, it's the blessing from God. God says, I'm going to pour out to you so much blessing that you're not going to be able to measure it. How many of you would want to have that kind of blessing in your life right now? Come on, church. Proverbs 3, 9 uh, through 10. I know I have 12 up here, but it's actually just two verses. It says this, honor the Lord. Say, honor the Lord. Honor the Lord, honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of your entire harvest. Then your barns will be completely filled and your vats will overflow with new wine. Listen, when we give, we must remember that the blessings God promises are not always material and may not be experienced completely here on earth, but we will certainly receive them in our future life with him. He says, test me. He says, I'm the Lord, I don't change. He says to this, to this, this, these people, these priests, stop robbing from me. Stop it. And if you do that, if you return to me, I'll return to you. And if you do that, I will give you a blessing that you will not be able to measure. Right? I will bless you. We're going, you're going to experience the promises of God. How many of you want to experience the promises of God? I want to experience the promises of God. God has been very good to me this week. God has been very great to me this week. I, God has shown me so many things when it comes to my family, when it comes to, to myself, when it comes to my friends. God has been showing me in time of prayer and just time of being with him. I have been experiencing the promises of God. Because I'm spending time with my Lord and my Savior. And I'm just like, Lord, I want more of you. I want more of you, right? Everything belongs to you. And I have been experiencing it this week. And you can too. Why? Because you and I serve the same God. And he doesn't change. He doesn't change. Experiencing the, the blessings. Experiencing the promises. I told you I grew up in the church, or I, I grew up in the church. My parents were devout Christians and loved the Lord. And I got to watch my parents tithe, even when the money wasn't flowing in like they were used to. My family, my brothers and sisters, and I, my parents, we didn't have a lot of money. But my parents, my dad was very faithful. My dad was very faithful with what he did, how he served the Lord. And, and, and my brother and sister and I, we, we saw that in my mom and dad. 
And, I, and, and I'll be honest with you, I saw them give. And they didn't give like, I don't know when we're going to pay the mortgage or how we're going to put gas in the car or how we're going to put food in, on the table. They never told us any of that stuff until we were older. They said, he said, Jason, I want you to know that your mom and I, we, were, we would constantly be, be giving our tithe. And we were wondering, man, we give this money away. We're worried about the brakes on the car. I remember my dad going over to the pastor's house and asking for money for rent for his house, yet he was still tithing. I learned that, I watched that, I saw that. It was a great example. <clears throat> and Trudy and I, we weren't tithers when we first got married. When we got married, we, we, we just didn't tithe. We, we, we held on to what was ours. We, we felt like we needed it. I guess my question is, is, where was our faith? Where was our trust? Where was our obedience? We just didn't give. We just didn't give. And then one day, and I'm talking, I mean, truly, that we've been married for 23 years, so it's like maybe the first four or five years of our marriage, even though I grew up in the church and and, and Trudy gave her life at the age of 13, and uh, you know, and here we are, we're combining forces, you know, Wonder Twins, Activate kind of thing, uh, you know, and we're combining forces, and we know what we're supposed to do, we know what we're, we're supposed to, to, to be. We didn't even go to church the first two years of our marriage. Then we started going to church. We knew what we had to do. Man, we served our faces off. We'll do whatever it is that you want us to do, but, but give our tithe, I uh, mean, we got, we got two little kids that we got to feed, and I don't know how we're going to do it. So we're not going to worry about that. Oh, no, 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 no. no we got to buy this car because the other car is about to go out, so I just can't tell you right now. I mean, Trudy and I were there. We were there. Then one day, we just looked at each other and said, okay, it's time for us to, to start being obedient and faithful in our tithing and giving. Here's one of the things that uh, I, I used to tell people. Listen, when it comes to, man, Pastor, I just don't know how, how, to, how to do it. Where, where do I start? And I'd be like, you know what? Why don't you start with what you got and then build up from there? You know, I was wrong in it. I was wrong in saying that. Because here's the thing. When God, God didn't tell the folks in Leviticus. He's not telling the folks in Malachi. Just give what you can. Oh, here's my 50 cents in it. Coffee. And see that if you give me, I will not bless you. We were sitting in, I was sitting in my room and I was just in my house and I became overwhelmed with everything. I was like, Father, you gave me this house. You gave me the cars I drive, the food that I eat, the clothes that I wear, the blankets on my, on my bed. You gave me my job. You gave that to me. Everything that I have is yours. Why would I not want to give back what was yours? And you're only asking a portion of it? And I'm throwing a fit? I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to throw a fit. Here, it's yours. Whatever you want. And I'm all in. Whatever you want. <laughs> Everything belongs to you. And all you're asking for from me is 10% of what is already yours? How selfish of me back in the day. How selfish of me. Where was, where was my faith? Where was my trust? Where was my obedience? I'm not going to be sugarcoat and say, hey, well, we, we decided that this is it. We're going to go all in. That the next day, that the next hour, that the next week, next month, my, my uh, issues with paying bills, because we were living paycheck to paycheck to loan. You with me? I live paycheck to paycheck. I got to get a loan. Paycheck to paycheck to loan. We'll pay off the loan. We'll pay, we're, we're robbing Peter to pay Paul. We were there. God, we're going to give you everything. We trust you. There's a, there's a thing called discipline. There's a thing called dedication. There's a thing called being obedient and faithful to God when it comes to everything that you have. Right? I, I got this job, and so it's my money. No, the Lord gave you the job. Because I remember sitting here with some of you praying for a job. God gave it to you. Father, thank you for the job. Thank you for the job. 
You see, when we work the ground, we need to realize that everything belongs to God. Everything. My life is yours, Lord. When my son was born, when Jacob was born, it was sketchy. We weren't quite sure in how long he was going to live. And I came to a moment when he was two. I said, Lord, I give my son to you. And whenever you decide to come home, okay. But in the meantime, I'm going to love on him. I'm going to raise him. I'm going to grow him up. I'm going to do everything I can. And when you want to take him, you can take him. Because he's yours. That's hard for a father to say. That's hard for any parent to say. But I only didn't say that about Jacob. I said that about all my kids. And I'm saying that about my grandparents or my grandkids. Lord, I just, I'm going to raise them up. As long as, as long as I'm here and they're here, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to teach them right. Do you know what Jacob is doing at this very moment right now? Do you want to know? Want to know what he told me he's going to do? Dad, since I can't come to church, I'm going to have church in my room. I said, you want to, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to watch Veggie Tales. <laughs> I said, okay. And, I, and he says, Dad, I know that those guys are just like fruits and vegetables and all that stuff. He says, but I'm going to shout hallelujah if I agree. <laughs> Jacob's having church with veggie tails. You know what he said? He says, I'm bringing Avery in the room too. <laughs> I said, okay. I said, okay. Everything belongs to God. Everything belongs to God. I, the Lord, do not change. I, the Lord, do not change. Stop robbing from him and experience his promises because God is always good. Yeah. Heavenly Father, I come to you right now. I just want to praise you and thank you. You are mighty, you are good, you are powerful. Your promises are great and wonderful. And Father, I know that um, we were talking about finances today. We were talking about your promises and what those look like. But God, I know that you're speaking into some people right now, Father, who need to experience your promises, need to experience you, God, in a way that they've never experienced you before. Father, they've walked in this room questioning themselves. What is my life worth? What's the value of it? Am I really that important? God, do you really see me? You see, God does see you because he says, I don't change. Man, I loved you in the beginning. When I sent my son, Jesus, to die on the cross, I don't change. My love hasn't changed. My love has grown deeper for you. I knew about you before you were born. I knew about you when we were creating heaven and earth. Oh, I knew all about you. I knew all about you. His love is deep and powerful and life-changing. His love is unshakable. It's unmeasurable. I want to be loved by a God like that. I want to be touched by a God like that. And some of you need a touch by God right now. Some of you need to be touched by God right now. Some of you need to realize that you are important. Some of you need to realize that you are valuable. Some of you need to realize that you are not a mistake. Some of you need to know that God loves you deeper than you ever could ever imagine. You need to know that. And I'm speaking that into you. Remember a couple weeks ago, we were saying, let Jesus grab your hand. Don't grab his hand. Let him grab your hand. Because he's the one that won't let go.
Because you said if we return to you, you will return to us. Father, you said that if we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. Father, we are drawing near to you. Thank you for not changing. Thank you for loving me the way that you are or the way that I am. God, thank you for encouraging me to change, to walk in the ways that you want me to be. Oh, Father, I need you. Just get real with Jesus right now. Let's just get real. Let's be honest. Let's be authentic in this place. Right here, right now. Come on, let's go. Let's, let's have a conversation with the Lord. Maybe some of you here have never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. Listen, every head bowed and every eye closed. Never asked. But you want him. You know you want him. In fact, you know you need him. I'm going to ask you to do something really brave. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to ask that you just slip up your hand right now. Just slip up your hand. Be brave. Raise it up. Maybe you've gone to church all your life, but you've never asked Jesus in your life. I want Jesus in my life. Just raise your hand. Just raise your hand. Hallelujah. Yep, I see you. I see you. Thank you, Father. Put your hands down. Some of you are sitting here right now, and you're like, you know what, Pastor? <laughs> I feel like those priests, and I feel like the nation of Israel at the time doing my own thing, walk into the playbook of the world. I need to open up his playbook. I need to get real with him. Some of us are sitting here saying, I just need to get real. Listen, nobody's looking. But if, if you're saying, I need to rededicate my life, I want to give my life all in. I want to be all in with the Lord. Just slip up your hand. Just slip up your hand. Yep, I see you. Yep, I see you. Yep. Hallelujah. Pastor, will you pray for me? Pray for me. Yeah. What you said is true. I gotta be all in. Everything belongs to him. I gotta be all in. I'm not gonna give my finances, but I gotta, I gotta dedicate my family to him, to you. Dedicate everything to you. I just gotta do it. Maybe you just you're suffering with something. Something's going on in your life. Only you can answer that. Saying I need prayer, will you just slip up your hand for just a minute? I want you up. I see you. Hallelujah. I see you. Yes, I see you. I see you. Yep. So good. Yep. You put your hands down. Oh, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your love and your mercy. Thank you that you are a God who does not change. You don't change the way you think of us. You don't change the way you love us. It's unshakable. Oh, man. Father, we just want to stand on the foundation that is unshakable. that they not only speak it, but they move on it. That they come back and say, Lord, I'm all in. I'm not going to walk by the playbook of the world, but I'm going I'm to get in your playbook, God. Look out, world. I'm getting in the playbook. I'm going to walk for Jesus. I'm going to get it right. I'm going to get it right with myself and get it right with my family and get it right with my friends and get it right with my job and get it right with my church. Get it right in my community. Oh, world, look out. Here I come. Here I come, devil. You get away from me. Oh, the Bible says, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Oh, I'm set on fire now because I'm coming back. I'm the prodigal son. I'm coming back. Lord, you're running down the road and you're going to meet me there. You're so constant and unshakable. You're holding on to me and saying, son, daughter, let's go.
go! Let's go! Woo! And I speak, Father. I speak in the name of Jesus that those who said, Master, pray for me. God, I pray, Lord, that those who raise their hands, and even the ones who didn't raise their hands, that's okay. Father, I pray, God, that they would recognize, Lord, that you're already there. The resources are here. I am available. I am at the ready. I am at constant. I am everlasting. I am here. Turn it over to me. He's here. Believe it. Stand on it. Trust him. I don't change. Some of you, I can feel it. Some of you are dealing with some kind of illness or something. In Jesus' name, I speak uh, against it. In Jesus' name, you are healed. You are healed. God is here. He is here. He is touching you right now. Oh, man. Some of you raised your hand and said, I want Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Listen, I want to pray with you. And I want to pray with you right now. The body wants to pray with you right now. We want to pray with you right now. And so I'm going to ask you to, to say this, this simple prayer, but mean it. I'm going to ask the rest of us to join in. So I just want you to repeat after me. Those of you who raised your hand and said, I want Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I just want you to repeat after me and everybody join in with me. Heavenly Father, it's me. I give my life to you. I'm tired of walking my own way. It's tiring. And I need you. I'm tired of faking it. I'm tired of walking the wrong way. I'm tired. So I surrender my life to you. I give it all to you. My heart, my mind, my soul, my strength, it's yours. Because I believe you died on the cross for me. And you took my punishment. And you took my sin. And I have been washed by your blood. And I believe that you rose from the grave. And that you are my Lord. You are my God. You are my Savior. Come take my life. Come have your way. I am yours. I'm sold out. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's celebrate that right now, everybody. Let's celebrate that right now. Come on. Give it up. God's not done. Oh, man, if we could be in heaven right now, just to be able to see the party that is going on right now because of you, because you give your life to Jesus, there's a party going on right now. So I want us to stand up. I want us to stand. We're going to close out this song, but listen. <laughs> These people didn't come forward just to stand and look at you. They came and they stood here. These are the these are leaders of your church. And they say, I believe in you. They say, I trust you. They say, I want to walk with you. Here's the thing, you raise your hand. I want Jesus. I, I need prayer. During this time, we talked about giving our first fruits to the altar. Giving God the best of the best. I just want to encourage you to come to the altar. Grab one of our hands and say, will you pray for me? Will you pray with me? Because you're not supposed to do this journey on your own. We're supposed to do it together. We're supposed to do it together. So let's sing this song. And won't you come? Won't you come? I, I want you to know not to freak you out in any way. But if you don't come, I trained my leaders last week to go get you. Now you're I'm never raised my hand again. That's all right. Listen. You need us as bad as we need you. 
there's going to be a time where, where I may need you to pray for me. Oh, and I'm not the guy who, who just says, I, I don't pray for me. I'm the guy who says, I need it. I need it. So won't you come? Won't you come? Let the Holy Spirit just take you. We want to pray with you. Celebrate with you. God does not change. God does not change.